Now on episode nine of the 52 Weeks of Reefing, this one was titled, Why Flow is Vital for a Successful Reef Tank. So many uh, you know, breakthroughs and lessons learned and things that we've learned about flow over the decades or how or whatever, especially recently in recent years, the last five years. Uh, we're gonna bring you up to speed uh, with our core belief. So core belief, the thing that drives all of the decisions that we make, uh, where we believe will, people will see the highest success paths. Okay, if a return pump is the heart of the system, water flow is the blood. Mm -hmm. Flow is what delivers and eliminates most of what the corals rely on to live. So corals have like a, I guess a semi-permeable membrane essentially yeah. with their tissue and everything that they need is delivered from the surrounding water. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be delivered at a rate that it can actually get through the boundary layer and hit the tissue, right? And also, all of the things that it needs to get rid of, the mm -hmm. byproducts and oxidants of uh, photosynthesis, it gets rid of through the pumping mechanism essentially of the water. And the more water flow, the better it's able to get rid of these things. Bring right? it in and get rid of. So yeah. it is very much, I'll read it again. Uh, if the return pump is the heart, the water flow is the blood, the flow is what delivers and eliminates most of what the corals rely on to live. The better we are at doing this will be the determination between whether or not the corals simply survive or whether or not they thrive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So starting with what we believe matters most when the terms of flow and why it's so vital, uh, it starts with WWC. Uh, a lot of uh, flow concepts are... Uh, Many flow concepts comes from uh, our mentors over at WWC when, it, when they talk about flow. So WWC says you will get more results from ideal flow than ideal lighting. I know, it's really hard to consume because people spend so much time on light. worrying about perfecting lighting Par and, and so little time about perfecting flow. It's mind boggling. Yeah, uh, right. Well, I, right now I can't measure any uh, measure flow in my tank. That's probably yeah. maybe it. Yeah. yeah, it's not as easy to digest or understand. We're going to start doing some BRS TV investigates mm -hmm. uh, probably right after, uh, probably January. So yep. we'll start yep. these things. We're going to better understand flow. And you're going to start, once you start getting the visuals with it, it's almost like the salt mix. Like until you showed me the clarity, until you yeah. showed me the uh, the gunk and in an environment outside of a idea. gray bin. Yeah. Uh, when I get it, I get it. The flow thing will probably give you We're that gonna too. Get it. We're going to get there. All right. So in that, what we matter most to uh, also came from uh, Josh here at WWC. It's not a mythical X turnover, but eliminating dead spots. So it's not just about having two pumps at the side that all have 50 times turnover. Because yeah. if you go actually look at it, you might have 50 times turnover as a number, but like in the areas where the aquascape kind of juts out or everywhere else, it might be zero, zero times turnover. Like almost no water is moving around there. We just said that the corals, you know, need flow to one, bring in, you know, food, nutrients, and you know, what they, uh, some of the things they need through that semi-permeable membrane. And two, it needs to expel some of those oxidants and waste. Well, if I'm, uh, if I'm unable to eat and I'm unable to go to the bathroom, I'm going downhill real quick. If you go look at your tank and you're like, hey, there's a little pocket area. These corals actually are surviving, but they're not really growing as fast as everything else. Check consider the flow. flow. Yeah. Consider whether or not it's flow. Uh, and so uh, eliminating dead spots. That means that I'm not just like tied to my favorite brand of uh, Vortex or whatever. It might mm -hmm. be the primary flow on the sides of it, but I can go ahead and add the Tuneses or Gyres or Waves whatever. And or aim them at the areas, yeah. you know, yeah. that uh, behind the rock, through the little... Uh, caves or whatever. And are you going to get every single last dead spot? No. no. But then smartly place your corals in the area in uh, those other areas. Well, I, you know, you how to, the, the goal isn't always perfection, man. It's just better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's, uh, you can do better than two pumps on either end of your tank for sure. Especially if you visually can see, hey, you know, that area is not doing as well as I'd like. We'll solve that. You can. Mm. Uh, and you can also choose to solve it beforehand instead of waiting for it because <laughs> it, it's actually just true. So, uh, and the answer to how much flow is as much as they will tolerate. 
So if the corals look like they don't like it, they don't. Mm -hmm. Short of that, it's not enough. Yeah. Uh, so just figure out whatever that is and aim them at the areas. Yeah. Uh, another area I think that we've explored is not pounding them the exact same way every day. Mm. Uh, varied point of turbulence. Yeah, this one was really interesting. Um, the If I got... Uh, a wind from one direction and the sun from one direction all of the time and I am a stagnant piece of human and I cannot move and I'm just dependent on variations in that, uh, I'm not going to survive very well. I'm not going to thrive very well. Well, A, you probably won't live very long and also you'll probably be weirdly shaped. I'll, I'll be shaped like this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, what we're looking for is varied turbulence. Yeah. Yeah, so, and this is, uh, with modern technology and modern, you know, pump flows and changing flows and things like that, a reef crest mode is a really very popular one with the MP40s. <laughs> the alternating gyre mode on gyres is a really popular one too, because instead of two pumps, uh, a, like, think of AC pumps, pointed at each other, both running at a thousand gallons per hour, smack it in the middle of the tank, and that's all they do 24 seven, or even just one pump that's pouring over like this. Uh, but that it's changing that point where they hit together. So. What if I increase ramp up this pump while this pump decreases? Well, now that point intersecting point of turbulence changes over here. And then what if I ramp up this one while this one decreases? Well, now that point of turbulence changes. And really, I'm end up, what I end up doing is creating currents in the tank. So basically, you're going to have water jets shooting at each other, mm -hmm. right? If they're all both at 100%, they'll probably meet in the middle and then just start blowing up, right? Yep. If I turned one to 80% and then the other one uh, to 20%, it's probably right here. Or even 100% mm -hmm. to 20%. It's yeah. probably way over here. Then I can actually flip that and move it over here. And then I can even do better if I got pumps on the back because it's not just right and left now. It's flushing out from underneath the uh, aquascape, behind the aquascape, through the holes. And then the more varied turbulence, the more, the, uh, the better the flow for the corals, better of the delivery of the elements they need, the better ability to get rid of it, but also the less likelihood that they're going to grow in like really weird oddball shapes. Yeah. You know, you're going to get a nice little colony out of it. So uh, very point of turbulence and changing it. And it doesn't have to be super complex. On, on my first tank, uh, David Gregor told me, Turn on this pump for a half hour, turn on this pump for a half hour, and then uh, turn on both pumps for a half hour. So they're kind of going this way, then they're going this way, and then it's just turbulent all over. <laughs> uh, and that worked just fine for mm -hmm. me. So it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be like super have duper be, advanced. Yeah, all these fancy modes and stuff like that. No. Yeah, and a lot of times the wave makers uh, of the world that are turning on little pulses for five seconds, if you watch, like you don't really get water moving in five seconds just yeah. like ooh, stop, ooh, stop, ooh. stop stop where if you leave it on man it like really starts to create a current so in most cases i think you want to leave them on long enough to create a sustained current, current rather than like little pulses and now one exception to that is if i have a tank just like filled with euphilia and i got aim uh, corals aimed all over the place little pulses might actually be the way to get lots and lots of flow without like pounding them so mm. the right tool for the right job mm. Uh, another thing that we believe matters most, flow and lighting are joined at the hip. And we're talking bleaching. Uh, and uh, you mean you just heard, you know, you just heard why flow is so important to the corals because it's the delivery mechanism for, uh, for what they need. But more importantly, it's the export mechanism from the byproducts of photosynthesis. Well, uh, lighting, if I'm, if I'm pushing photosynthesis and turbocharging as hard as I can because I know that uh, they are photosynthesizing the most at 200 to 350 par and uh, I keep my tank at 200 to 350 par throughout the main part of the day, constantly photo photosynthetic or photosynthesizing, meaning there's a lot of byproducts being made, which means there's even more that need to be flushed away. These are why these two are joined at the hip. So one of the main reasons people believe that corals bleach is actually because they can't get rid of the oxidants mm. created from photosynthesis as fast as they're being created. Right. Uh, and those oxidants are just going to kill it rapidly. And so eventually the coral just says, 
I have to stop producing all these oxidants, and the only way I can do it is expel all the zooxanthellae into the water. Bleach. Right? And then it bleaches, and it'll probably die mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just a last-ditch attempt to survive to save in itself. that world, yeah. right? So if you're going to ride the razor's edge of lighting, you have to ride the razor's edge of flow to help that coral get rid of all those toxins that it's creating through excess photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So that's why in the wild, it's like shutting itself down in many in those cases. peak hours right? of the day, right? When it's 1200 par and whatnot. And so and, and in the wild, you may have like constant flow solving that problem uh, as well. There's strong currents, there's all kinds of things. So mm -hmm. uh, think about that, that flow and lighting are joined at the hip. Don't attempt to ride the like high end of uh, lighting and if then, you're not going to ride uh, the high end of flow. And then again, not because I got 50x or 150x or whatever. Yeah. No, it's about getting flow where it needs to go and as much of it as possible. Wow. All right. Another one thing that we believe matters most that probably a lot of people have heard by this, but many people might not know, is uh, when a pump is clean... It takes less power or, uh, or more power than when it's dirty. Yeah, so this was just uh, an epiphany moment when we were, we tried it on the 160, where it's like, ah, okay, so there was a day that, uh, and I don't know if it was the, the start of that, but there was a day when I noticed that, you know, one of, our, one of my canary corals up here that I was uh, watching the whole time, uh, back when I was taking care of the tank, uh, just... It was it was a STN. It was a slow tissue uh, necrosis that was happening, and uh, I couldn't figure out what it was. And I'm watching. I was like, "Okay, chemistry's right." I sent an ICP test and all this other stuff. Come to find out, I put your hand in the tank, and that gyre pump that is usually running just was completely dead. Uh, it wasn't running, and it was caked over. Uh, and then the you know the latest model of the Apex came out and you have individual outlet power monitoring where you can say if my power is outside of one of these ranges let me know and alert me and then it was like okay so let's turn on the power monitoring for a power head and just find out what happens and sure enough wattage draw started going down as the pump got dirtier meaning uh, we're not getting the flow that we are, had out of it. I'm not an electrical engineer. I would have thought the opposite. I, I would have thought 100%. When, if it was yeah. gunked up, it, you would think the pump is working Try harder. Try really hard to yeah, push that prop. it's going to suck up more juice. Yeah. It's the opposite. opposite. Spin slower, and then it sucks up less juice. But you can use this tool, like that. you can use that knowledge for a whole lot, apply it to a whole lot of other things here, but specifically as flow is concerned, I can apply it to you know, everything that pushes water around in my tank. It's, it's about that life support thing. It's about like if the return pump, and we want to monitor that, and we want to have redundancy there, well, if the water and flow is the blood, wouldn't I want to know if it's running 70% lower, or in your case, zero? Yeah. Yeah, I do want to know, man. I want to know quickly. And yeah, one of the frustrating parts that I found, actually, was during that whole process, what we were doing is we were using air bubbles and stuff to figure out the perfect flow. We were watching the turbulence going back and forth. We spent like a whole day, you know, perfecting the flow on the tank. And then I walked up to it like a month later and I'm like, it is not doing what I thought. And I blew the air bubbles and it's not doing it. Yeah. yeah and I found out it's because They're even dirty. just after a month <laughs> that the gyres had like slowed down so much that it wasn't producing the same thing yeah, that I thought. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so I like it, Really having an understanding that a clean pump actually takes up more power, a dirty pump actually takes up less power, is how you can use the kilowatt, how you can use the power monitoring mm -hmm. on a controller mm -hmm. to tell you when to clean the things and actually have the blood helping yeah. you get rid of the toxins and add the nutrients. And you're not, yeah, you're not cleaning the pumps for the sake of the pump. You're cleaning the pumps for the sake of the corals. That's the best thing you said all day. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I will take my coffee. And go you're not on. doing it for maintenance, man. You're doing it because the organisms inside the tank rely on you they to, need to, it. to care for them. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. Uh, another thing we believe that matters most when it comes to flow is it's uh, if if it's easy to clean, you will do it. And the, I mean, obviously, this applies to a lot of different things, but specifically like power heads and flow. If it takes me two seconds to pull out a, uh, you know, like the wet side of an eco, of a, a Vortec and put in a new one and maintenance is done. I am, 
way, knowing myself, I'm a hundred times, a hundred percent more likely to do it because I, I'm even looking at uh, some harder to clean pumps in my tank in my office. I know they need to be clean, but I know the time I, in the back of my mind, like what, what that's going to take for time. And that just makes me procrastinate even longer. Okay. I'll give you three different outcomes for cleaning your return or your, your power heads. One of them is a Vortec. I have an extra set of wet sides around. I walk up to the tank. I swap them out. I'm done. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, another one is uh, I walk up to the tank. I decide to clean up my gyres, my tuneses, my CJs, my whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I've uh, zip tied everything down and it's all super neat and clean. And I had to go cut all of that apart. I haven't left myself with any slack. And so I had to go in the back to cut it out. And I had to remove the whole thing. Guess what I'm not going to do. I will never in a million years <laughs> do that. Uh, and so you may have just, it, like, it just made it impossible to do. Yeah. If, however, what you do is leave yourself a couple feet of slack and you happen to have a bucket, Shh. you can just take the pump and put it in the bucket with some citric acid and have it run and it will clean for the most part. Uh, you may want to actually disassemble it after that and get all of the stuff out sure. of it. Uh, but, but you even, just made it easier. You made it easier, but I will tell you that this still takes an hour of your day. Not only an hour full time, but it, it still takes, I gotta go get the stuff, mix it up, put the bucket there, find something for the bucket to sit on, put the pump in there. Yeah. Uh, and that is why people probably don't do it. So when you're selecting the pumps that you want to use in your tank, think about how important the flow is. It's part of the life support system. How fast it's going to fail you. If it fails, what would happen? And what do I need to do to it's prevent amazing. that? And in my mind, the Vortex, arguably, uh, almost unarguably, the easiest solution because you can walk up and just swap them out, you're done. And when I bought my Vortex, I'd buy an extra wet side right then and there because yeah. you're missing half the value if you can't do that. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people hear that advice, you know, coming from us or, or what have you and say, oh, they're just trying to push Vortex pumps and stuff like that. No. Like, I, I believe it wholeheartedly because I am a, I suck at being consistent with maintenance. So it needs to be convenient and easy for me to do so that I will do it. You know, honestly, I don't even want to bother with that mindset anymore. Yeah. Like, you know, we just kind of defend against that idea of like, hey, well, you know, Ryan and Randy sell stuff, you know, like, yeah, dude, full, full well. But you know what we do is we help people be successful. And that is the end of the story. If you're lazy so like me. If you're successful, uh, the longer uh, it's in your best interest, it's yeah. our best interest. If you sell you garbage that uh, won't help you, uh, that is nobody's best interest. <laughs> so uh, swapping out and having easy maintenance and providing life support for the tank, if you believe in that. Higher path to success. Yeah. Okay, Which better. Yeah. the point of what we're doing here. Core belief here isn't, how do we make most money selling pumps? You know, <laughs> no. A core belief is, if the return is the heart, the water flows the blood, flows what delivers and eliminates most of what the corals rely on to live. That is the thing that we need to solve. Base our decisions off in of. In everyone's best interest. Yep. Uh, another thing that we believe matters most when it comes to flow, and we will learn in the upcoming year, we have so many flow tests planned out, is that wide versus narrow versus a sheet or a blade. Uh, it goes back to the, you know, I'm gonna fill my pump full of uh, tuneses. Uh, because I love tunes. Yeah, they're good at you know, a specific job, but you really what we should be picking our pumps for is not necessarily brand affinity, not necessarily gallons per hour either. We're going to find that out too. Is I, uh, Should I be picking 2,000 gallon per hours and looking in 2,000 gallon per hours across all the different brands? Not even close. What we should be considering is the flow pattern and the needs for our tank. Flow pattern meaning I may have a 2,000 gallon per hour pump that has a very narrow beam and high to high velocity type pump versus a 2000 gallon per hour pump that has a wide angle, slow and low velocity. Those are two completely different types of pumps and gallons per hour had absolutely nothing to do with that, uh, with it and it shouldn't be a part of the decision making process. Who cares? If it is? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll give you a couple of examples. If I have a LPS tank, I want really wide cones of water that doesn't just blast everything. Yeah. Flow that surrounds and gets everything, mm -hmm. keeps it moving, mm -hmm. but I'm not pounding it, you know? Yeah. Uh, if I've got a SPS tank, I usually want turbulence and so almost like little laser beams that hit each other and then vary <laughs> 
around and create a lot of turbulence yeah. in, in, in the water. Uh, if I'm on the back of the tank, something like a gyre turns sideways, shoots water in a sheet across the back and creates a motion around the tank. Yep. If I want to get water over the top of the tank, blade. a cone isn't going to do that very no. well. A blade like a gyre really will. If I want to get uh, uh, from the top into a little cave down below, actually, uh, like a, I can look at the tunes and I know already what they do just by looking at them. The ones that have an extra tube on the outside actually focus that into like a little laser beam that will get it down where I need it to be, yeah. which is flushing out through that cave. If the mouth of the tunes is open and wide, it's going to shoot it in a big, uh, mm. uh, a wide angle. So it's not about the brand or it's not about the gallons per hour. It's, it's about... Zero right tool, right job, understanding what the type of flow I'm trying to create and then applying it to that solution. You're gonna see that probably with every single pump that we make. You're gonna see yeah. visually how these things create turbulence. You're gonna see how they actually, the angle, the degree that they come out yep. and give a way that you can visually see it and then imagine it in your own tank. I foresee a future and I really hope it comes true where you don't see gallon per hour rating on the pumps anymore, especially like in a description. Like it would be nice to know like what I'm getting into, but instead of gallon, just, hey, 2000 gallons per hour, this is what it does max, or, or blank to blank, uh, this is what it does. How about it's cone shaped 2000 gallons per hour, it's wide angle 2000 gallons per hour. There should be some terms in the hobby that define what we're getting into so I can make an informed decision just by reading what it is. I'm gonna take a stab at this. And I, I don't, this isn't ready yet, but. Okay. Like, I like the gallons per hour because I know how much water it's turning over. Yep, 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 yep. But what if it gave me velocity at feet, mm. right? So one foot away from it, if I got a laser beam, it's shooting water You're at you know, 60 or 10, 10 feet a, a second or whatever, right? But if I had a big giant cone, it's also 2,000 gallons an hour and a foot out, it's probably only going to do a velocity of a half a foot a second. Oh, right? I can make a smarter decision yeah. on what it's So done. I got the gallons per hour. But I also know the velocity of the water, the speed at which it's traveling at uh, certain intervals. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I think it would be very this helpful. It's going to be great, uh, great testing coming up next year. Okay. Uh, another one here. And this goes back to the electricity thing. Uh, and I'm going to, I think this is important. This is like, think about where you live. If you live in California, you have brownouts constantly, big deal. Uh, if you're a, in a, a hurricane area, big mm -hmm. deal. If you're in a tornado area, big deal. Ice storms, if you haven't, storms. If you haven't ever had a power outage in your lifetime, not a big deal. Uh, but higher, I, pa higher path of success here. Higher path of success. I wouldn't even. Uh, I wouldn't run a tank without a power head that's attached to a battery backup. Meaning the only ones I can think of off the top of my head are the Tunes's with the safety switch or connector. Yep. Uh, I think there's one for the gyre. Gyres, that one kind of comes ebbs and flows. Yeah. Uh, then uh, also the big uh, one for the uh, Vortex. I would not run a tank that ha doesn't have a single power head that's plugged into one battery backup. If I had to, I would use the UPS. You heard us earlier talk about how mm -hmm. we're, those things don't run very long and they're, they're actually not the greatest value per dollar. Right, right. Like by a pretty big magnitude. But at the same time, and it doesn't mean that all of the pumps have to be on a battery At backup. At least one. Just one, right? So if I had a Vortec on the thing and it was on a battery backup, all the rest of them could be whatever I wanted. Mm. I don't have to have that. If I have one tunes that's on a battery backup, it's probably enough. But again, the water flow, which is the thing that's creating gas exchange, it's getting rid of the excess CO2, it's adding oxygen to the tank, it's keeping everything alive. Mm. If that stops, the blood flow, uh, what's happened here is the power goes out, the circulatory system's gone, the heart's gone, the life will be gone quickly it's, after. It's like putting you in a sealed room uh, for and saying, all right, how long, uh, start the timer on how long you can breathe until you're gone. Like, yep, it works until it doesn't. Until it doesn't. Yeah, ah. depends how big the room is, uh, but 
Yeah, uh, and it also depends on how many people are in there. Yeah, exactly. So if it's just me and Randy Can sitting in this big old room, we got know. we got some time. We got some time. Uh, <laughs> if we go in the closet and seal it, uh, yeah, less we time. We less time. If we put sixty people in here, less time. So think about your tank in that manner yeah. too. Like how many things are consuming all of those things. The time in which you have to react uh, is very proportional to the amount of life depending yeah. on it as yeah. well. Uh, another thing we believe that matters most uh, in terms of flow. Uh, and I found this one on my own uh, until um, the MP10s or MP40s or any of the Vortec pumps, they just look awesome on the back of a tank. Like if you have a cube tank, yeah, I've had multiple cube tanks in painted black or even a, just a regular tank with some space behind the wall, uh, they just disappear. So it's kind of like this. Uh, it's if I put the MP40s on this side or the, you know, they're kind of like a cordless option because there's no cord in the tank, mm -hmm. right? I don't see any wonky, irregular cords in the tank, which is what distracts from the beauty of all right. But there's cords on the outside, but if I had to pick one or the other, I'll put them on the outside. Yeah. But if you put the cords on uh, the motor on the back of the tank, like we do with the 60 cubes, uh, and you can just kind of flush water around in different directions, well, now you can't see a single cord on any of it. There's no pumps that are really visible at all. I mean, like the really only true, like I guess, cord really cordless option is probably a closed loop. Yeah. But uh, putting the MP40s in the back, man, if you can do it and it provides the flow that you want, <laughs> is the most aesthetically pleasing option, bar none. Yeah, I like it. Uh, and you actually just hit the next one too. Uh, what believe matters most? Closed loop is the only uh, true cordless uh, flow option. So you know what another thing a closed loop is actually good at is getting flow from the bottom yeah, up, yeah, right? Because you can put little nozzles in. Mm -hmm. I, Sean's tank, uh, the 2000 gallon tank that we went and toured a couple years back, uh, he had a lot of those closed loop systems, pumps coming up from the flow, coming up from the bottom. And good, I mean, it, it, for a size of tank that huge, you ha almost have to consider closed loop because the amount of, and he's growing SPS and sticks in there. And we just said flow is, you know, one of the, biggest components when and he's got you know, 20 Orfix or whatever uh, on his thing. So he's riding the razor's edge of light. How do you fill a giant tank like that with flow uh, without filling the entire viewing panes full of power heads? Cords. The closed loop. Yeah, cords, power heads, plug-ins, the whole nine. Closed loop was the uh, solution. So people ask a lot, like, should I do a closed loop? My answer is generally no, because uh, power heads are so much easier to use and they fit the 99%. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. All right. But if you have a big tank or you have a big aversion to cords, closed loops are the best. And it used to be also that a closed loop required a big, noisy AC pump. Uh, and they're inefficient. They produce, produce a lot of heat and stuff. And now with the, today's DC pumps that are quiet, you can actually, and they're smaller, mm -hmm. you can put closed loops all over the place and it actually probably wouldn't be that hard. Yep. You're gonna have little more leak points with bulkheads drilled in. You're gonna Swiss cheese your, your <laughs> tank a little bit. It's a much more complex install. So kind of like the way I look at it is, if you had to ask, uh, probably Powerhead's a better solution for you. Yep. Uh, if you want a closed loop and you've done all the research on how to do it uh, properly, well then a closed loop actually is one of the cleanest ways to add, uh, uh, especially if you build your aquascape first, put the aquascape in the tank, mm -hmm. and then say, where do I want to drill the yeah. holes for the closed loop? We will probably have the best flow solution yeah. known to man. No, no cords, no power heads, no nothing, maintenance is. You can hide it inside the rock uh, even. Maintenance is a breeze. Yeah, ah. so there you go. There you go. Uh, also, you heard it a little bit earlier that uh, one of the things I believe most matters is uh, either just use uh, your manual pressure out of your chest or get an <laughs> air pump uh, and blow bubbles into the tank and watch where they go. Yeah. Watch the velocity, watch the empty spots, watch for like, oh my gosh, I had no idea there was mm -hmm. no flow there at all. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've done this a couple times. We first started doing that on the 160 um, and got an like a, an air pump that had four or five different valves. And then you just kind of drop the little tips in the right underneath the power head. Uh, you just kind of drop one of those air, air lines underneath there and let the bubbles go up into the power head. And the power, it will tell you where all your flow is going. And you could easily see like the change in the turbulence when you were watching these bubbles. You watch those bubbles, you know where they're going. Couple of tidbits though. 
Uh, one, if you blow too much air, it actually slows the pump down, yes. so it's not an accurate uh, depiction of where the air bubbles are. Also, if you can find ways to make smaller, finer bubbles, they'll stay in suspension in the water longer rather than float to the top. So yeah. uh, like something like even like a, a skimmer motor could do that, yeah. uh, an air stone could do that. Uh, but just finding ways to make smaller bubbles will allow you to see the flow pattern better. And that's probably one of the best tools, you know, using that air pump or even your breath or whatever it is, just to look at where is the flow going and where isn't it going. And you might also correlate, oh, wow, that's at, why that coral looks like crap. Yeah, that coral has <laughs> always been, you know, white and pale and just really weird looking right there. Not hardly grew. It's still a frag. And then here we are, you know, however many months later. Uh, oh, no, the bubbles aren't even reaching there or the bubbles just stop when they get there. Yep. Ah. All right. Uh, uh, there's one tied right next to that. Uh, yep. It's uh, use the feed mode. We believe matters most. Mm. Using using the feed mode. Uh, you know, there's so many. You know, use the one of the biggest problems when feeding, of course, when uh, you always hear every all over the time is don't let it go down the overflow. And you know, there's uh, smart return pumps that are so smart that they keep the lines charged, but they don't let the drains come back and you know, probably one of the one of the easiest ways to keep food from going down your overflow is to slow down your flow pumps, your power heads, so that they're not kicking all the food around, and you actually uh, you have a you know, a spot where your fish can come and feed rather than chasing it all over, and then out it goes out into the overflow. It is true. Use the feed uh, mode. Feed mode. Ten minutes. Use it. Uh, you can save a lot of nutrients. Yeah. Use half the food, half the nutrient and still feed the same amount. <laughs> uh, all right, so one thing also is flow is a million times easier in a bare bottom. That's true. Not blowing around the sand, so that's one of the reasons for bare Crank bottom. Up. Uh, I will tell you this is what I found out too. I mean, we're actually talking about, I mean, the Vortec does a lot of things that are unique, so that's probably what we talk about all the time. But uh, the Vortec, you can put it on the bottom and shoot water across the bottom. Yeah. Now, technically speaking, you could do that with any pump, mm -hmm. right? True. Just put it down the bottom. The problem will be is it's bad enough to have a wonky cord coming out of the top. It's, it's much worse if you have to have the cord go all the way to and the And you bottom. know the cord does this the whole way down. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why nobody's ever like created a nice straight thing. We've said that so yeah. many times. I mean, if you could just silicone like a little thing with a cord in it, yeah. and maybe I would put a tune in the bottom. It wouldn't really matter that much. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, SP, if SPS dominated riding the razor's edge of flow and lighting and all this other things, uh, that's probably why I'm so tied to the bare bottom, even though I know it's a harder harder hump to get over initially in the first two years. Uh, but, it, but I can ride that that flow. It just flushes all the gunk off the bottom and it goes yeah. right out down the drain yeah. and pulled out by your roller mat, skimmer, filter sock, whatever it is. So 100%. I, I, if I had a bare bottom, I would have pumps on the bottom for sure. If I had, had to, I'd aim them down at the bottom. But having like a, after I've done it in a few different tanks, we did it in the 60 cubes with the Vortex were on the bottom. We did it in uh, my own tank, the 360 shooting across the bottom. We've done it in the worldwide uh, coral tank yep. shooting across the bottom. It keeps it so much cleaner and like reduces a lot of maintenance and just all the gunk is gone. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a much cooler thing. All right. Hard lessons in relation to flow. Why flow is vital for a successful reef tank? Hard lessons that we've had, you should try to probably try to avoid. Avoid these lessons. That's what we're telling you. First one is don't blast anything. It'll make it ugly. <laughs> yeah. If you blast a coral with flow, if it doesn't blow the tissue off, it will actually grow. Grow in this weird pattern. So, uh, that's yeah. why you have buried flow. That's why you don't put a pump blasting right on something. You try to get it around uh, and creating turbulent flow that doesn't come from just two pumps. There's nothing worse than seeing uh, the tip of your neon green torch, uh, little pieces of it floating around the tank because you blasted it with flow and it, just, it lost yes. the tips. Ah, terrible. Uh, okay, another hard lesson, and you heard this. I really like gyre, so it I do too. sounds like a... a like we're it's not a, not a dig on them. No, it's just real. They, they real. slow down faster than most pumps. Yeah. They require more maintenance. You have to clean them more mm. often. Uh, it's been my experience anyway. Yep. Uh, and so 
just hard lesson. Just remember that. Know that because you're going to end up in the experience that you talked about is it actually will stop entirely and then corals start dying. Yeah. And I mean, especially this is kind of what came out of uh, this is where the see how, you know, we aquascape the 160 higher than a half halfway up the tank. Uh, and then you run into this problem where your corals are growing up to the surface and, you know, without a, a pump like a gyre, we it would be very difficult for us to solve for that that issue of corals growing now up to the top of the tank because it's one of the only pumps that we can put that high up and get a sheet of water over the cross the top of the corals. So super valuable. Just make sure you clean them a little more frequently. This is actually coming together for me in this one too. This is the next one here is hard lesson. Don't wait for death. Don't wait for what Randy did. Yeah, uh, exactly. Stopped, it's, right? I called it a canary coral when actually I shouldn't have been waiting for the canary coral to start dying before I decided that there's something wrong. Yeah. Okay, this actually ties together with, uh, we talked about the adaptive reef makes those uh, uh, like a green light and red light telling mm. you things are good, things are bad. Mm -hmm. Also, they have a little audible alarm. And the first question you'll have was like, well, why do I need all of those things? Why don't I just have the audible alarm? Because I don't need to be able to, I can hear it. I don't need to see the red thing. Well, so audible alarm could be things like, man, come save me. It could also be the things that show up in your email alerts, right? Emails like, uh, you know, pounding you with like, come save me, come save me. Or right. like text messages are coming, come save me. And then there's also things that I don't actually want to email 8 million emails or text messages about. I just want to know on Sunday when the time comes, I should go do something about it, which is I can set up an alarm that turns on that little red adaptive reef light on the apex to say, Ah, it's time to clean your pump. Time to clean your pumps. I don't need an audible screaming alarm yeah. on that. No. I just need to be told when it's time to so do that. So when I walk by, I go, oh, the pumps must be running at 30% less uh, power than when 100% because my red light's on. It's time to clean it. So that's like a really good point. Is like you could have yeah. two things in your, I could have an actual emergency alarm. Like literally it's taking only five watts when it should take 60, yeah. which means the only thing that's actually running is electricity in the box, not mm. the pump. Uh, but I can also at 20 have this little light go on that says, hey, you should probably clean me That's or smart. you're going to end up like Randy did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another hard lesson here is uh, not using a battery backup. And, you know, it leads up to what we believe matters most was uh, would not run. It would never run a tank without a power head that has their battery backup. We found out and the reason why those two uh, play into uh, our beliefs here is because you know, 750 XXL was the like 2,000, two grand in fish or five grand in fish or however much it was lost uh, because we had we had Vortec pumps on there. They have the best battery backups out there. We failed to put them on. We didn't have the Apex heartbeat on to tell us that the uh, Apex was disconnected and the GFCI broke. What we're left with is dead fish when we come here. And we forgot, uh, we just didn't use the battery backup. Do not let that happen to you. You don't have to learn the way that we do. You can choose a different Gosh, path. That was such <laughs> really a hard do. day. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, a couple of other ones here is a hard lesson. Brand loyalty, throw it in the trash. Like it doesn't, Ecotech doesn't make the best stuff. Uh, Mac spec doesn't make the best stuff. Uh, the yeah. wave isn't the best thing. No, pick the right tool for the right job and decide what it is you want this tool to do and then pick the job that does that. If it's, if I need to be able to aim it, it's probably the tunes. If I need really light, gentle flow, it's probably the CJ uh, uh, extreme. If I don't want to see the cords, I want to be able to go off to the bottom and maintenance really matters to me. It's probably the Vortec. Mm -hmm. If I need sheets of water, it doesn't maintenance, doesn't matter, man. It's probably the gyre, right? Yeah. So don't get stuck on brand loyalty and any one of these things makes a better option than the other. They all make something better for a different application than the other ones. Use it as such. Uh, Ocean's Direct blows all over is a hard lesson learned. That's uh, the sand that you had chosen. We got three bags of it going uh, yep. with the uh, with the Dream Reef. Um, but Ocean's Direct is, uh, you know, it's a type of sand that uh, isn't sifted into very specific granular sizes. That's where your special grade comes from. That's where your oolite comes from. Uh, your Fiji Peak has some pink quartz in there, what have you. Uh, but it's not a uniform size sand. It's a uh, little bit of, little bit of small, little bit of big, little bit of bigger. 
mixed in, it does blow around. So in that spirit, like a lot of people will like, well, what if I put uh, oolite in my tank and then I just, uh, in that one spot, or I mix in some bigger stuff. Well, what will happen is all the oolite will blow out and then you'll see a big chunk of bigger stuff in the middle. Maybe that's okay to you, maybe it's not. True story. But no, with high flow, obviously the stuff blows around. Uh, and the next one here is a hard lesson uh, that I don't think, this is just starting to come out uh, into a, like a wider accepted uh, conversation. No amount of pumps will get past a poorly designed aquascape. Man, do you, man, okay, so we talked about, you know, eliminating those dead spots is kind of is the goal when it comes to flow and things like that. You know how hard it is to eliminate dead spots when you built your aquascape poorly where there's nothing but places for water to stop flowing? Extremely hard. You know how many pumps it's going to take to do that? Versus if you made a smart, if you smart built a smarter aquascape with this flow in mind, uh, the hurdle to jump over of getting flow in all of the different places has now lowered significantly. So in many cases, if we uh, build the wall type, just stack the rocks against stack the back, up. really the only place to apply flow is two pumps staying aimed at each other. And yeah. in the front, we just kind of hope that it does whatever it's going to do. Yeah. But Everything all the water and through it, all the water in this stagnant and all of the garbage that settles out there stagnant will never be flushed out. It'll just sit there and rot. All the stuff behind it will do the exact same thing. And so uh, when I say poor aquascape, you can just decide for yourself what that means. But like if you're building your aquascape, think how would I apply flow to this aquascape? Mm -hmm. And if you at least have that question in mind, you'll produce a better result. Because you can see, I mean, once you get used to seeing the flow and flow patterns and dead spots in tanks, and you, I would challenge you to go, uh, whenever you come up on tanks, like look, when you're looking at a tank and you're uh, admiring the tank, uh, just take notice of where the dead spots are in that tank. And you can apply that next time you build an aquascape. Like, huh, I don't think I'll ever build one of those cove type, uh, cove things with an overhang over the top of it. Because guess what? There's no flow happening right there in that cove. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna re. I'm gonna rephrase. When I said no amount of pumps will get past a uh, poor aquascape, a lot of pumps. I'm just gonna say it will take a lot more pumps to get proper flow in a poorly designed aquascape yeah. than it would in a good one. Uh, and again, good, bad is all about your specific desires. But if you think about flow when you're building it. It will almost be, um, it will absolutely be better than if you didn't think about it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, another piece here, hard lesson, is installing it once and thinking that you're done forever and not adapting the flow to coral growth because what was a bunch of open area with a little bunch of nubbins on it, all of a sudden isn't the same when that coral right here, my favorite one, is now blocked the flow from this side and this side and this side. Well, now some of my favorite corals are not getting the flow they need because the other corals next to it are blocking it. Yeah. I may need to add extra pumps. And I got news for you, a colony of a frag that costs 100 bucks that is now a big old 8-inch colony uh, costs 10 times what the pump costs to point at it. <laughs> uh, and so think about it in the frame of mind that it's more of a journey uh, and that I need to you know, evolve my approach to flow as the coral yeah. changes the needs for the flow yeah. and the flow patterns because it might be different over time. And I think in the future, like as we explore flow and the different flow patterns that comes from pumps and what you know when you would apply it and what situations you would apply it, this is this is going to be easier to do as you get uh, as you you know grow in the hobby and your tank grows. Like uh, if I if I'm thinking you know. All right, from back when this 160 was in its first year versus where we are now in, in six and some change years, uh, you know, I wouldn't have considered, I probably wouldn't have considered the gyre uh, as uh, if in the initial. And we didn't consider the gyre in the initial. There was four tunes that started this tank. Now there's, you know, four MP40s and two gyres on either side. And uh, all of those needed because the, the way that the coral grew. Flow behind it with two MP40s, flow in front of it with two MP40s, and flow over the top of it to account for the fact that we don't have little one-inch nubbins in here. We have yeah. big, giant colonies, some of them over a foot across, 
they just wouldn't do well if we mm -hmm. decided they were just going to put two pumps in the front and call it a day. Tanks aren't set it and forget it. Yeah, you learn and adapt with it. So the big question uh, right now is uh, what is next?